We will continue our discussion of uh, latest vibrations in one dimensional solid. Uh, previously, we considered a one dimensional solid in which all the atoms and all the bonds were uh, between the atoms were exactly identical. Uh, in this lecture, we would slightly complicate the uh, situation and consider the case where you have uh, two different types of atoms or two different types of bonds uh, in the one dimensional lattice and see how does the uh, vibrational um, frequencies of uh, such a lattice looks like. These are the two the readings uh, which you can look up for this current uh, lecture. So in the previous uh, lecture, we assumed uh, this case of one dimension solid in which all the masses were the same uh, and all the interatomic uh, bonding were identical. Uh, such a system is usually an idealization and in most cases materials are made up of more than one type of atoms and more than one type of bonds within the atom. So we would, in this uh, lecture, we would take up the case uh, of a diatomic chain. So a diatomic chain is such that it consists of two different types of atoms and uh, or two different types of bonds. So for example, you can have M1 and M2 as two different uh, type of atoms with different masses. And K1 and K2 would then represent the two different types of bondings between uh, atoms, between neighboring atoms. So I mean uh, practically two different spring constants. So to uh, solve for such a uh, atomic chain, uh, the first thing we do is uh, identify something uh, which is a unit cell of this uh, diatomic chain. So to define a unit cell, you have to look for repeating unit in this uh, case. So you can have, um, you can define a unit cell like this, in which uh, you define it uh, in this way that uh, uh, M2, which has mass, M, uh, the atom M2 is on the left side of the unit cell and M1 is on the right side of the unit cell. This is one way of uh, do, uh, doing it. And uh, K2, which was this, uh, kappa 2, which was this uh, bond, it is in the middle uh, of this unit cell. Or you can also define this unit cell in this way that M1 is on the left hand side and M2 is on the right hand side and kappa 1, uh, which is one uh, type of bond, is in the middle. So this is another way of defining a unit cell. So in either case, whether you define it this way or whether you define it this way, the basis for this uh, uh, one dimensional uh, lattice consists of two atoms and not one atom as we were previously assuming for a, a monoatomic chain. So that's the main important difference here. So what does it uh, uh, mean? Uh, it means that let's say if you have L uh, as a length of the one dimension solid, the total length of the solid and uh, then the number N which is the total length divided by the length of the unit cell, it would give you the total number of the unit cell. And this number would not be equal to the number of atoms in the solid uh, because each unit cell now contains two atoms. So the number of atoms would be twice this, the number of unit cell here. So that would be the main difference uh, in a diatomic chain as compared to a monoatomic chain, uh, which we were previously considering. So. Uh, so once uh, you define your unit cell either in this way or in this way, it's important to identify the coordinate of each type of atom in the unit cell. To define the coordinate, uh, one has to first identify the unit cell. Um, let's say we identify the unit cell like this. The next thing to do is identify uh, your reference point or the origin uh, within the unit cell and let's say that is exactly in the middle of the unit cell represented by this point X here. So this X uh, would be our reference point uh, for this particular uh, unit cell within the lattice. And uh, then we can identify the relative position of each atoms with respect to this reference point. 
for example this uh, uh, mass which was uh, m2 it is uh, 3a by 40 uh, dis distance away from this reference point so this is this is written in such a way that this ratio is in the uh, is a multiple of a where a is the uh, length of the unit cell uh, similarly, this other uh, atom, or which is uh, we identified atom one or m with a mass m one, it is at a distance of seven a by twenty uh, from this reference point. So uh, we have defined a unit cell, and that unit cell uh, may be any number of unit cell. Maybe this is an nth unit cell within this long chain of atom. And uh, within that particular nth unit cell, you have uh, defined a, a reference point. And with respect to that the reference point on, of the nth unit cell, you uh, identified the relative positions. So mathematically, you can write them as the position of the nth unit cell would be the position of the nth reference point, which would be uh, this point exactly where you take the, uh, the reference. Uh, and that would be a n in general where n would be an integer uh, and would represent the number of the uh, most probably a positive integer if you are uh, starting from uh, zero uh, and uh, it is multiplied by a which is the length of the unit cell uh, to give the reference position of the nth unit cell once you identify this then you can find the position of each of these atoms within this uh, uh, nth unit cell. So <clears throat> the equilibrium position of uh, uh, this atom, uh, which is the M2 atom uh, or the light gray atom, uh, this would be given by a n minus 3a by 40. So this would be the um, equilibrium position of the light gray atom in the nth unit cell. What would be the position of the dark gray atom in the um, nth unit cell? Uh, I would represent it with a different uh, symbol, uh, not x. So y would represent the position of the dark gray atom in the nth unit cell and uh, equilibrium mean the equilibrium position. So this would be equals to a n, which is the position of the uh, ref nth reference point in the one dimensional lattice plus 7a by 20 which is the relative position of the dark atom with respect to the reference point so uh, you can put any value of n here and uh, you would uh, and in this way just by changing n you can uh, find the equilibrium position of any atom whether a dark gray atom or a light gray atom within the one dimensional diatomic chain of atom. So one thing I would be uh, what uh, we would do in this lecture is to calculate or to consider a diatomic chain such that all the atoms within this change chain are identical but the bonds uh, or the interatomic forces uh, or the interatomic springs uh, between neighboring atoms, they are all of two types. Uh, this would be technically also a diatomic chain, and the reason being this that you have two different types of atoms in this chain uh, a dark gray um, uh, atoms with mass m, such that on the right hand side it has a spring of spring constant k power 1. On the left hand side it has a spring constant of uh, kappa 2 uh, so these are two different springs arranged with this order uh, around this atom uh, but this light gray atom that it has a different arrangement of springs around it it has a kappa 2 spring towards right and kappa 1 spring towards left so all the light gray atom would have this arrangement and all the dark gray atom would have the uh, other arrangement so in principle you do have a diatomic chain here so uh, we would solve for this and the reason being is that the solution for this problem is easier but the physics of this is very similar 
to the case we are considering uh, we, we initially wanted to take into consideration so either you take uh, two atoms uh, of different masses or you take uh, two atoms of same masses but connected by different strings uh, both of them um, would physically give you this uh, similar results uh, although qualitative Quantitatively, they might be different, but qualitatively, they, they, the results are exactly similar. So let's solve for the normal modes of uh, such a diatomic chain in which all the masses are the same, but the springs are uh, of two types here. So the first thing you do is to identify your unit cell, uh, which consists of these two atoms. Now, uh, these are two different atoms because the gray uh, atom a dark gray atom it has spring k1 towards right and spring k2 towards left uh, similarly but the gray light gray atom has spring kappa 2 towards right and spring kappa 1 towards left so if you imagine that these springs would apply restoring force on uh, this uh, light gray atoms uh, it would the restoring force for the same displacement uh, to the right would be different than the restoring force on the same mass for the same displacement to the left uh, and this combination uh, would be exactly opposite, uh, opposite to uh, for, for that uh, dark gray atom. Um, you can identify the uh, equilibrium position of these two different types of atoms. Um, uh, uh, Xn would represent the position of the light gray atom in the nth unit cell and Yn would represent the position of the uh, dark gray atom in the nth unit cell and so on. And these atoms can then displace from their equilibrium position and the displacement uh, can then be also identified via the displacement of the x and y coordinates. So del Xn would be the displacement at a certain instant uh, of the um, light gray atom in the nth unit cell and del y n would represent the disp the instantaneous displacement of the light gray a dark gray atom uh, in the nth unit cell so uh, now we can to find the uh, normal mode solution for uh, such a chain you have to uh, form an equation of motion so let's do it for the light gray atom uh, in the nth unit cell so m uh, mass time acceleration of that particular atom in the nth unit cell it should ideally it should be equals to uh, the uh, difference in displacements multiplied by the spring constant as we have seen for normal mode solution so uh, this atom uh, would have two different restoring forces acting on it uh, the restoring force from the right spring which would be given by kappa 2 and the magnitude of uh, that uh, would be given by the difference of these two displacements which is uh, the difference between del xn and del yn so that would be your first uh, restoring force which would act on this uh, light gray mass in the nth unit cell uh, towards right uh, what would be the left force uh, the force on the left hand side depends on it would not depend on kappa 1 uh, kappa 2 rather it would depend on kappa 1 which is a different spring and it would depend on the difference of displacement between these two atoms now which is the displacement del y n minus 1 of the n minus 1 at dark gray at, uh, of the dark gray atom in the n minus 1 cell and the light gray atom in the uh, and it's cell. so that's the uh, equation of motion for this particular atom in the nth unit cell uh, you can similarly write uh, an equation like this for the dark gray atom and it would be different in the way that uh, for this atom which is the dark gray atom the right uh, uh, the restoring force which acts on it towards it its right it doesn't depend on kappa 2 as uh, it depend as it was the case for the first atom rather it depends on kappa 1 and the displacement of this atom and this atom the difference of these two displacement so that's kappa 1 and for the left hand side it would depend on kappa 2 so this uh, combination 
uh, um, it, it really makes a difference between the two atoms. That's why you write two different equations of motion uh, for such a diatomic chain. So what would be the solution or the answered solution or the educated guess solution for uh, these displacement equations of motion? And uh, so there would definitely be a traveling wave solution. And because you have periodicity, um, uh, what you would have is uh, you would have a solution of this form that the displacement should be given by, let's say, a, a certain uh, amplitude uh, multiplied by an oscillating uh, oscillating phase, uh, which uh, depends on uh, the time. It would depend on position. And because you have periodicity, the position is discrete position given by the um, position of the uh, um, light gray atoms, uh, the equilibrium position of the light gray atoms in the chain. So you can, for this uh, solution, you can start your, or uh, you can start your uh, uh, so-called origin from a light gray atom, and you would end up uh, like this with a, a light gray atom in the nth unit cell. Uh, but you can also have another solution for the dark gray atoms and it might have different displacement uh, for uh, because the, the spring uh, combination for this is different. Uh, again, uh, for this, uh, the position would be discrete and discrete. Uh, then in this case, you can find that uh, the distance between any and neighboring um, dark gray atom is given by A, and that's why the, the positions are discrete and uh, discreetly written in this way. So the idea for normal mode solution would be what is the relationship for the normal modes uh, between omega and k, uh, where k are uh, wave vectors. So we can define a uh, a brilliant zone for this kind of lattice and those brilliant zone would have different k values uh, and then so we know what k values they would be and then we want to know what would be the omega for each of those k values for normal mode oscillation of such kind of a diatomic chain and this would be basically our solution or in other words we are looking for dispersion of uh, this chain so to do that first let's say you you start with this so you have two uh, equation of motion and two uh, estimated solution of this traveling waveform so let's start with this uh, x position x displacement equation so you can put this equation into the, the equation of motion here the left hand side you have to take twice the derivative with respect to time and because you are taking twice the derivative you would have a omega squared multiplied here and uh, you, because you have an exponential here <clears throat> the exponential uh, you can split it into its time part and its position part uh, so this would be the left hand side of the first uh, equation of motion what would be the right hand side the right hand side would have this term uh, in which you have to write uh, the solution uh, del y n and then you subtract it is from it the solution del x n and if you do it it looks something like this so you have kappa 2 multiplied by the solution uh, del y n minus the solution del uh, x n uh, and i've taken ei omega t constant from here uh, plus you would have this other term which would be the restoring force uh, uh, to the left side of uh, this uh, uh, xn atom and that would be given by the y uh, the dis the um, temporal displacement of this uh, atom minus that atom which would be given by ex uh, by this term so using these two solution and putting these two solution into the first equation of motion this is what you get you can do a similar exercise for the second equation of motion and put these two solutions in there 
and what you get is uh, an identical um, uh, not identical but a similar looking equation uh, slight with a slightly different arrangement uh, of terms but uh, that's uh, uh, the two equations you get uh, by putting your answered solution into equation of motion so the idea would be to uh, 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 make it to, to extract the dispersion relation to do that uh, first I would do take the first this first equation and uh, take this e i k a n which is a constant uh, common term in all uh, a common factor in all these terms and take it out of this bracket this square bracket and what do you get is this e i k n uh, e i omega t because this was already uh, there in on either side it cancels out uh, and e i minus i k n is taken out uh, as common from all these so you are left with these terms inside the square bracket and a similar exercise you can do for this other set of equation uh, for, for this other equation uh, would look something like this uh, so these e i k n factors because they are same on the other hand side they would cancel out and you can multiply a minus sign on either hand side so this is this would uh, be uh, this is how this equation would come which is the uh, first equation so uh, because you multiply a minus sign here so a y minus x become a x minus a y and similarly this other one uh, in the same way you can uh, also do the same manipulation with the second equation and it would take a form uh, which would look something like this so uh, we can again rearrange this first equation in slightly different form so what we do is we add up all the terms uh, which uh, comes with a x so you have m omega squared and on the right hand side you have uh, kappa 2 a x and kappa 1 a x uh, both of them goes to the left hand side of the equation and becomes kappa 1 plus kappa 2 uh, multiplied by a, a x and you can take a x common from this term uh, then you are left with this a y uh, terms uh, the a y terms has uh, k2 a y here and k1 a y here with an exponent uh, so you take them to the right hand side and it becomes something like this so that's the equation you get uh, the first equation takes this form similarly the second equation which would be this it would take this form by rearranging uh, these terms in terms of the coefficients so these coefficients are uh, a x and a y they uh, represent the amplitude of oscillations uh, for the for the latest vibration and ideally we would like to also know uh, what are the uh, relationship between the, those displacement as well as we solve for normal modes so these displacement which is the displacement of one type of atom and the displacement of the other type of atoms a x would represent the displacement of the light gray atom and a y would represent the displacement of the dark gray atom these uh, in a normal mode solution these should uh, be related to each other as well because all the so the oscillation in all the uh, atoms in a normal mode so these are the uh, two equations which you get in terms of the coefficients and you can make them uh, you can give them uh, this form by writing these two in terms of this matrix like equation uh, and now you look for non-trivial solution of this equation so of course the trivial solution would be a x and a y both equals to zero but that would mean that both the uh, both type of atoms are sitting exactly on the equilibrium position not a very interesting solution um, in the normal mode lecture i uh, uh, um, we looked uh, in a similar at a similar kind of uh, equation and we found out that the uh, non-trivial solution can be found by uh, um, uh, of such a secular equation can be found if we find uh, the uh, of this matrix uh, which is on the left hand side here of this equation it, it is equals to zero this would give you non-trivial solution uh, or at least the condition for the non-trivial solution so let's try to find out what are they and they should basically give us our dispersion relation so 
uh, expanding on this um, uh, determinant, uh, you get this equation, uh, which is a quadratic uh, a quadratic equation in, in omega. So uh, these two terms multiply, which gives you this term, and uh, this term minus uh, the other diagonal product should equals to zero, and you take this to the other hand side. So these two terms will uh, be equal. Uh, you can multiply each term over here and these, this product of these two brackets, it expands into this form and uh, you can uh, add up these two exponential terms by uh, expanding it into the cos and the sine uh, form and because uh, the phase are opposite, then it would mean that the, <clears throat> the sine term they cancel out and you are left with the cos k terms in, uh, in these two terms. So this would be equation and from here if we re, uh, take a square root on either hand side so you take a square root to get uh, this term which is on the left hand side without the square and on the right hand side you take a square root uh, with a plus minus because these are the two possible. This equation uh, it suggests that omega should have four uh, four values. Um, uh, to find those, you can rearrange this equation to to find omega squared, and then uh, to to find the values of omega, you need to take a square root again, and it looks something like this. So these are the four different values. So uh, you get plus minus uh, here which would give you different magnitudes of the square root and uh, then this magnitude would have a plus and minus over here. The four solutions uh, for the dispersion of the a diatomic chain uh, and uh, it's a dispersion relation uh, because there's a omega on the left hand side and k which is a wave, uh, wave vector it is on the or the wave number it is on the right hand side uh, but uh, we have a restrictions on the values of omega and that restrictions directly come from our answer solution uh, which assumes that either uh, k is positive or negative and omega is positive only or uh, omega can be positive or negative and in that case k uh, should be positive only so what we assumed uh, normally the convention is to take the omega is positive and kappa should take a negative or positive value. So it would which would mean that we can discard these negative values of omega. So we would be left with only two values of omega which would be the normal frequencies of these normal oscillation modes of a diatomic chain which would be given by this thing. So uh, we label those two frequencies by uh, uh, either by a plus or a minus uh, depending on whether you take a plus sign in the square root here or uh, the minus sign here. So this is our dispersion relation uh, which is a dispersion for uh, normal modes in a diatomic uh, chain uh, which is a one dimensional chain. So this question is uh, how does this dispersion look like? So uh, you take a certain value of k and uh, what you get is you get two different frequencies for that value of k and so one can plot this whole dispersion in a first brilliant zone between minus pi by a to plus pi by a and it looks something like this so it has two frequencies uh, each k point it would have two frequencies and omega minus frequency and omega plus frequency and you can do it for all the k points within the first brilliant zone and uh, uh, you get some uh, plots like this. So you have two different uh, uh, branches of so called lattice vibration this uh, omega plus branch it is called as the optical branch of lattice vibration. And omega and this omega minus branch, which has a lower 
magnitude it is called the so called acoustic uh, branch and because uh, what you have is um, uh, the dispersion uh, has an oscillatory term here in a cause in the form of a cause of ka so its uh, um, uh, periodic function in the k space and uh, identification of a brillion zone or the first brillion zone would make sense here uh, and again you can check that the periodicity is uh, given by 2 pi by a in this case so that's the uh, dispersion of a diatomic chain in uh, uh, a one dimension diatomic lattice so we can look at the limiting values here uh, for example i would be particularly one can be particularly interested at let's say what uh, what are the frequency values at k equals to zero at and at the brillion zone boundaries? So let's start with k equals to zero case. So if you take k equals to zero case, uh, you have two solutions here uh, one for the acoustic case and one for the optical branch. So let's check out for the optical branch. So if you put k equals to zero here, this cause ka it become one and this term uh, which is in the square root it is k1 plus k2 whole square and you take a square root of that uh, you end up with k1 plus k2 and because in omega plus you are adding up so you have k1 plus k2 uh, uh, by m and uh, you have k1 plus k2 by m uh, what you get is twice k1 plus k2 by m square root here so this will be the frequency uh, the value of the normal mode at k equals to zero here, uh, which is exactly um, at k equals to zero of the optical branch. Uh, this one is pretty straightforward. This uh, would equals to um, uh, a zero here because uh, if you take a minus over here, you have k1 plus k2 by m here, k1 plus k2 by m here. They simply subtract out to give you a zero value. So that's that it would be a zero uh, here. Now coming to the values of this, uh, um, the values of these two branches and the brilliant zone boundary. So let's take the case of pi by a. Uh, you can find the value uh, for omega plus, which is the optical branch at this position. So pi by a, uh, it would give you cos pi here and cos pi will give you minus one so this would be k1 minus k2 whole squared square root which would give you k1 minus k2 and if you add k1 plus k2 with k1 minus k2 by m uh, you would uh, end up with 2k1 because k2 would cancel out so you would have 2 kappa 1 by m that's the um, value of the optical branch at, at the Similarly, you can find the frequency of the uh, acoustic branch uh, normal mode at the brilliant zone boundary, and it uh, turns out to be 2 kappa 2 by m. So, uh, what do we mean by these? Uh, it will become clear later. So, so uh, we get these normal modes uh, such that for each k value we have two different normal modes for oscillations of these atoms and since in um, one unit cell we have two different uh, ty uh, types of displacements uh, we would like to know what is the relationship between these um, two displacements delta l um, of one atom and another atom within the unit cell uh, for us uh, for a certain mode so to do that uh, so to look at uh, to find the uh, the relationship between the displacement uh, which would be actually the relationship between a x and a y uh, we, we start from this uh, equation which we derived earlier or uh, this uh, coupled equation um, which we derived earlier for the two displacements 
so which connect the these two uh, magnitudes a x and a y and to find the relationship between displacement for optical wave and displacement in acoustic wave um, uh, let's take a limiting case uh, and the limiting case we would take uh, let's say uh, for those uh, wave numbers uh, which are very very small or which are close to zero so we would confine ourselves to this region around k equals to zero so i can write rewrite this uh, equation in this form uh, by separating m omega square uh, from the rest uh, and this is what i get and now since uh, i'm taking this limiting case where k is very very small or uh, close to zero then e uh, i k a it would approach is one so basically i can for this limit particular limit i can take i can equate um, these exponents into one if i do this i get this uh, type of um, uh, coupled equations and i rearrange it uh, to get this uh, this form for it so basically i take k plus k1 kappa 1 plus kappa 2 common take it out uh, you get this um, kind of a matrix and then you divide m on either side to get this, this form now this uh, um, uh, this contain two uh, two separate equations um, and i would first look at those two equations for the acoustic branch so for the acoustic branch if you take this limiting case the acoustic branch has frequency equals to zero which means that this side would be equals to zero so uh, i can make these two equations uh, uh, now from the right hand side and both of these equations would be equals to zero for example you for the from the first line you get a x minus a y equals to zero from the second line you get minus a x plus a y equals to zero and both of these uh, tells you the relationship between the two coefficients uh, for the displacement of one type of atom and another type of atom in the crystal and that uh, displays and that relationship is that that for acoustic branch for lower uh, wave number or for very large wave lengths uh, what do you have is that the displacements of uh, both the masses are in the uh, exactly the same and in the same direction so uh, you can also write uh, th these two displacements as a vector uh, as a vector like this such that both uh, would have the same magnitude and the same sign so what does it mean for the actual lattice so it would mean that let's say ax represent if ax represent the displacement magnitude of uh, the light gray atom and ay represent the displacement magnitude of the dark gray atom so if one is displaced towards the right by a certain magnitude the second one would be displaced by the same magnitude towards right and uh, similar for all other atoms so uh, you can have a displacement of both these atoms have the same magnitude and in the same direction you can imagine uh, the displacement in the other direction as well as you have uh, oscillation either towards right or towards left so this is what um, this branch um, the oscillation the normal oscillation in this branch would look like for small uh, k values which would mean that the atoms uh, uh, the first thing is the wavelengths are very long and in these long wavelengths in acoustic mode of oscillation the, uh, the different atom they um, oscillates in tandem so either they go towards right or go towards left uh, so the, the case for space. the acoustic branch let's look at how does the optical branch uh, looks like at k equals to zero or in this range so optical branch the frequency the omega which you get uh, is uh, we already calculated previously was here so in this equation uh, put these uh, the square of this on the left hand side here you get uh, this term multiplied by 2 uh, and the, this term would cancel out on either hand side and uh, the resulting equation would be of the type 2ax equals to ax minus ay for the first uh, line and uh, 2ay equals to minus ax plus ay for the second line so this is the equation uh, or this is the relation which you would get for um, the displacement in the optical branch. 
and if you uh, both of these equations give you this relation which tells you that if the displacement of these two atoms uh, have the same magnitude but they should be in the opposite direction uh, uh, which can also be represented in a vector form like this so uh, in the uh, optical acoustic branch uh, for lower k values or, or k values close to zero you have oscillations in tandem so both the type of atom would move or would be displaced in the same direction by the same amplitude uh, but in the optical branch which would represent oscillation in this mode uh, you would have um, oscillation in such a way that if the displacement of one atom is in the uh, towards right with a certain magnitude the displacement of the other would be towards left by the same magnitude uh, and so on for all the atoms so in this case the atoms would move either right or left towards uh, by the same magnitude in this case uh, they would oscillate in the opposite direction each one of them so this is how the uh, oscillation freak uh, amplitudes relationship between different atoms are in the case of these two different branches we solved for the case where the masses were all identical but the uh, spring constants uh, were different uh, in the assignment you would be asked to solve for a problem where the uh, masses are different and all the spring constants are the same so you would have you would solve for two different masses m1 and m2 and it would turn out that uh, again the problem gives uh, same kind of two branches of the phonons in which uh, the around k equals to zero the optical branch uh, would result into a mode such that the two masses they at any given instant they have uh, a displacement in opposite direction while in the acoustic branch the two masses are displaced uh, in the same uh, direction spend some time the same on the at each instant uh, uh, various so representations of dispersion in reciprocal space so that's the kind of dispersion uh, which we uh, already looked at uh, represented in first uh, brilliant zone and the form of dispersion was such that it repeats itself uh, in k space so in other words it would mean that let's say if you have a certain uh, number of mode with uh, their corresponding frequencies uh, the same mode would uh, be there at uh, any value of k plus minus g where g is a reciprocal lattice uh, vector given by 2 pi by a uh, and they are integer multiples uh, where m is an integer so uh, any dispersion at k and k plus minus g uh, whatever the value of g is uh, in terms of 2 pi by a uh, it would be exactly the same uh, so that's uh, written here uh, this would mean that uh, you can basically move your branches by a g dispersion by a g vector and things won't change for example if i take uh, for example this branch the optical branch uh, the left hand side of this optical branch and if I move by a reciprocal lattice vector g uh, towards right or add a reciprocal lattice vector plus 2 pi by a with it, uh, it shouldn't physically matter because by this relationship uh, it should physically be the same. And similarly, I can move this side of the optical branch and subtract uh, 2 pi by a from, uh, from its argument, which is k and i won't uh, it would still be the same so if i move these two branches by one by plus two pi by a and one by minus two pi by a i get a situation like this so uh, you see uh, uh, a band of energies in which you have uh, lattice vibrations are allowed and then you have a band of energy where these vibrations are don't are not present so these are the so-called band gaps and then they reappear uh, at higher energy so uh, you do have presence of the band gaps in for the latest vibration energies which would mean that these energies are not allowed for uh, this atomic uh, this diatomic uh, solid
uh, it's a similar scenario for uh, as that of electronic uh, dispersion in the electronic dispersion uh, in periodic solid uh, there were band gaps which appeared and you, you, you do have a similar scenario over here um, so uh, and this band gap uh, results into uh, a, a flattening of this uh, dispersion curve at the brillion zone boundaries so of course this gets appear at the brillion zone boundaries and at that uh, k value the dispersion has a, a slope of zero or they are flat which would mean that uh, the, the the latest vibrations or phonons which occurs at this k value they they won't be able to propagate in the solid because their um, uh, the, the, the group velocity is zero and group velocity is the velocity with which uh, the uh, the waves moves inside a solid uh, so in uh, the only difference the main difference between this uh, kind of a dispersion for latest vibration and that of electrons in uh, us uh, in a periodic potential is uh, at around k equals to zero so at k equals to zero uh, you see a linear dispersion for these latest vibration or sound waves but for the case of um, electrons uh, around k equals to zero the dispersion was a parabolic dispersion uh, another main difference is for large values until very really large values of k the dispersion here is pretty linear it only start deviating from linear uh, at uh, near to the brillouin zone boundary so the acoustic branch can be approximated as a linear dispersion uh, for most practical purposes and uh, that's a very valid represent, uh, represent, a representation of the acoustic branch uh, so what if we what would happen if the uh, two springs which are different uh, they start becoming similar so what do you expect for the gap then so these gaps uh, the this higher frequency it has it is dependent on kappa to the lower frequency uh, at the brillouin zone boundary it depends on the value of kappa one and if both of them are, are becoming uh, similar uh, it, then these two branches would uh, merge together and the gap would simply disappear so you would have uh, uh, more or less a, a continuous dispersion between minus 2 pi by a and plus 2 pi by a so what the, does it mean uh, actually so uh, it seems that the brillouin zone boundary has been extended to plus 2 pi by a and minus 2 pi by a instead of plus pi by a and minus pi by a so to look why this occurs uh, so if both the springs are similar so this diatomic solid it uh, start becoming something of a monoatomic solid which we looked previously where all the springs and all the masses were exactly the same uh, but the thing is in this problem we are taking a unit cell which is this long uh, or which has a distance a long uh, such that it includes two unit uh, two masses uh, but those masses are the same and the springs are the same so basically what we are doing is we are taking a periodicity uh, which is double the actual periodicity or the actual periodicity is half of what we have taken here so this a should be uh, is the actual value of the uh, of the uh, repetition is a by two rather than a so uh, a prime which is a by two should be our new um, uh, uh, distance to should uh, interatomic distance in terms of a which we defined for the diatomic case so uh, uh, then pi by a simply become pi by a by 2 or 2 pi by a so you that's why you have a plus 2 pi by a minus 2 pi by a because the a here is defined in such a way which is equal to twice the uh, actual uh, interatomic distance so uh, this would make sense here so find all the possible representations uh, which you can have uh, uh, of the dispersion in reciprocal space uh, we already saw this reduced zone uh, way of re uh, of uh, uh, the representation in which you uh, 
you move all the branches into the first brilliant zone and represent it in the first brilliant zone. So that's all the physics is uh, already in the reduce uh, in the first brilliant zone. This is called as the reduced zone scheme. But then you can also have an extended zone scheme in which you just simply uh, let only one branch be in um, one brilliant zone and move the rest by reciprocal lattice vector into the neighboring uh, brilliant zones. Uh, so that would be the extended zone scheme. Uh, even another scheme which is sometimes used is called the repeated zone scheme in which the reduced zone representation is uh, repeated uh, again and again in the in the case space. So um, these are all different ways of, re uh, of representing the same phenomenon. Until now we have seen uh, two kind of one dimension solids, um, a monoatomic solid and a diatomic solid. Um, Apart from this variation, uh, there are other uh, uh, possibilities as well. For example, you can only take uh, uh, longitudinal oscillation or you can also take into account the two transverse oscillation. So these are called as uh, polarization of the lattice vibration. So uh, in general, you can, in, um, uh, if the atom, uh, if each atom in the crystal can oscillate in all three different directions or the three degrees of freedom, then it would have three uh, polarizations of its lattice vibration. That is uh, one longitudinal and two, two transverse uh, polarization. So uh, let me take uh, make a summary of the these uh, different scenarios which occurs in a one dimensional uh, solid. So the easiest uh, case would be that of a monoatomic solid in which all the atoms and all the springs uh, constants are the same and you allow the atoms to vibrate only longitudinally uh, along the chain direction. So in this case, uh, you have these displacement which are only along the di uh, direction of propagation of the wave or the displacements um, which is the also along the uh, direction of the atomic chain as well. So in this case you have only uh, in the dispersion there is only one branch which is the acoustic branch and more specifically the longitudinal acoustic branch represented by LA. If uh, we have a monoatomic uh, chain like the one we above uh, but now you allow not only uh, the uh, vibration the, the longitudinal vibration but also a transverse uh, vibration uh, which would be vibration perpendicular to the propagation of this uh, lattice vibration wave. So in this case uh, because you have a monoatomic lattice uh, you still have only one branch there is no optical branch just a good acoustic branch but the acoustic branch uh, in general can split into three different branches uh, and a longitudinal acoustic branch and true transverse acoustic branches called as TA1 or TA2. So the longitudinal LA would be the same as uh, above. Uh, this would uh, represent a wave which propagate in this direction but in this case the displacement uh, is perpendicular. Uh, it can be perpendicular along the y direction which uh, is shown here either up or down along y or it can be into the uh, page and out of the page would be the z direction which might represent a ta2 uh, so a ta1 would be a transverse oscillation along y a ta2 would be transverse oscillation along uh, x if the propagation in is along z so this uh, would be uh, the case for the um, uh, monoatomic uh, one dimensional lattice uh, of course, these branches, uh, they may, I have plotted them in this way that in general they have uh, different uh, uh, spring constants. Uh, so all the three branches are uh, have different frequency modes. But sometimes uh, two of these modes, for example, the, the transverse would have the same frequency and uh, these two would merge into a single um, branch which would be uh, transverse branch uh, combined.
Uh, now let's uh, take the diatomic case in which you take a diatomic case uh, of two different atoms or two different springs depending on uh, which case you are taking and uh, take uh, just the longitudinal uh, oscillation so you do have uh, so you get two branches here again uh, one a longitudinal acoustic branch and one a longitudinal optical branch so in the optical branch both uh, at a certain instant if one atom is displaced in one direction other would displace in the other direction in the acoustic branch a displacement of both the atoms are low, uh, low type of atoms are in the same direction so these are the two branches which you would have for if you allow the atom to just vibrate along um, the direction of propagation of the latest vibration wave. Uh, if you have a diatomic, uh, one, one atomic lattice, but if you allow vibration in all three directions, then uh, each of these branches they split into three branches, their own um, one longitudinal and two transverse, uh, one longitudinal acoustic and two transverse acoustics. So uh, the longitudinal acoustics would be similar as we've seen before. Uh, longitudinal displacement um, both uh, uh, in the same direction, and in in this case, the transverse wave uh, would be the transverse displacement both in the same direction of both atoms. Uh, in this case, uh, the long uh, in, in the optical case for the transverse, uh, if one atom move up other atom uh, displaces down this would be transverse oscillation direction and uh, longitudinal optical would be longitudinal displacement but in opposite direction for the two atoms within the unit cells so this uh, these would be the different cases uh, in which you can summarize the long latest vibration results for a one dimensional solid so just to make this point clear that uh, all these different displacements which I have uh, shown here, uh, they are valid in these branches only for small k values or, or for longer wavelengths. Uh, the motion of these atoms or the relative motion of these atoms or displacement of these atoms, they become different uh, near the brilliant zone boundary. So uh, just take these as approximate motion of atoms for uh, small k values. So, uh, it might look, uh, uh, you might think about, okay, what about more complicated solids in which you can have many different numbers of atoms and um, uh, various different kind of combinations, how many different branches of acoustic and uh, optical uh, vibrational mode should I see in this case. So uh, here uh, I would like to generalize uh, uh, for any, uh, any number of uh, atoms um, in a uh, in a uh, crystal and I would generalize it for uh, uh, three-dimensional motion uh, or in other words uh, for all the three polarizations of lattice vibration so consider um, any lattice breve lattice uh, or out of the 14 breve lattices we have discussed um, in the previous modules so if you consider a breve lattice and in a breve lattice if you take uh, r as the number of atoms per lattice point uh, which is usually we refer to as a basis or in other words r is the number of atoms in a primitive unit cell so if you define a primitive unit cell in a breve lattice it would contain one lattice point and you can put or you can arrange atoms uh, around that lattice point uh, for all the latest point in the uh, in the latest and that would make you a crystal so the basis which you arrange around a certain latest point uh, would be uh, it would be your uh, the atoms which you arrange around a certain uh, latest point would be your basis and the basis r would be the number of atoms in those bases uh, so we have already seen and uh, done this exercise quite a few times so let's say r is the number of atoms per unit lattice uh, points or per uh, unit primitive unit cell then uh, you should uh, observe 3 into r dispersion curves in your lattice vibration 
dispersion so three times r out of this three times r three would be the acoustic branches uh, uh, which would be uh, represent the three polarizations uh, uh, so one of them would be uh, acoustic uh, longitudinal acoustic and two would be transverse acoustic the rest uh, oh, three minus three r minus three because you have three r in total three r acoustic the rest would be uh, all of them would be optical branches uh, so yeah so the distribution of these acoustic branches are shown here uh, these optical branches uh, then would have uh, one third of them uh, would be a longitudinal optical one third of them would be transverse optical uh, in one direction and transverse optical in another direction so this is a general uh, classification uh, of any um, of lattice vibration dispersion for any solid if you allow uh, atom to vibrate in all three uh, direction possible so imagine uh, as an example i would start with a, a basic example uh, what you have a Bravais lattice uh, it can be a three-dimensional lattice uh, what would be its um, uh, dispersion how it, how it would look like if you have one atom per basis in that crystal so if you have that case you would only see an acoustic um, branch uh, so you have a case which is somewhere here uh, you would have only acoustic branches with one of them as a longitudinal acoustic and two as a transverse acoustic and of course in the uh, real solid the shape of the these branches may look quite strange uh, because real solids are more complex than uh, what we have been assuming until now so uh, let's discuss a slightly more complicated example um, of real solid um, and for this I would uh, consider the case of a copper crystal uh, which has uh, uh, an FCC lattice which is a face centered cubic lattice which is again a Bravais lattice and the basis consists of a single copper atom at 0 0 0 which means that you put a uh, copper atom at, at each lattice point in the FCC crystal uh, in the FCC lattice and you would get a copper crystal so uh, in this case uh, the total number of atoms um, uh, in a primitive unit cell so you can this cell which is plotted here is not a primitive unit cell it is a conventional unit cell but you can definitely draw a primitive unit cell which would have a volume one fourth of this conventional unit cell uh, but that would contain one lattice point or one uh, atom uh, copper atom uh, precisely so the number of atoms in a primitive unit cell or the number of atom per lattice point in this crystal is exactly equals to one so according to our uh, uh, previous general formulation um, such a solid would have uh, only three uh, latest vibrational branches uh, and those would be acoustic branches only they such such a, a crystal should not have optical branches so um, three acoustic branches uh, would mean that uh, one would be longitudinal acoustic and two would be transverse acoustic so let's see how does uh, the real uh, dispersion of uh, such a solid looks like so here is plotted a dispersion of uh, let us vibration dispersion of aluminum which has exactly a similar crystal structure and FC with an FCC lattice as that of copper so this dispersion might look uh, a bit strange over here uh, because it's not uh, symmetric around k equals to zero uh, but um, this dispersion uh, on this side half side is plotted along 110 direction and in this case is plotted along 100 direction so uh, as you might uh, know that uh, in a cubic system whether it's an FCC or BCC uh, you can have a 100 plane and a 100 direction would be perpendicular to this uh, this plane um, similarly you can have a 110 plane uh, plotted as here and a 110 direction would be a direction perpendicular to this uh, plane and similarly for a 111 
uh, as well. So here uh, you have uh, uh, on this side you have a dispersion plotted side the the latest vibration that uh, move along one zero one one zero direction which would be in this direction within the crystal and on this side the dispersion is plotted such that the latest vibration moves uh, along the one zero zero direction which is this direction so the dispersion uh, uh, in both these directions look different uh, and they look uh, they may look different because uh, the vibrations in different direction may indeed be different so on this side you uh, see only one transverse acoustic branch and one longitudinal acoustic branch in this case you see uh, two transverse branches and one longitudinal acoustic branch so it would mean that in this direction the two transverse uh, uh, oscillations they have exactly the same frequency and that's why the, they are degenerate and in this direction they have different frequencies and they are non-degenerate uh, so uh, you in uh, in real cases uh, where you see literature or research literature you will only see half side of the uh, uh, first brilliant zone the other half is usually not shown uh, in the same direction uh, because it's usually identical to the left hand side so if it's symmetric if it's symmetric it doesn't um, it's understood that it's not represented so uh, one important thing I would like to describe here is uh, in the brilliant zone boundary uh, which occurs along 100 direction is not at pi by a but rather at 2 pi by a because this this is plotted in terms of 2 pi by a and you might be wondering why that's the case why the brilliant zone is not at uh, pi by a so uh, the brilliant zone boundary should occur at pi by uh, the interatomic distance in that direction. So if you look in this direction, which is the 110 direction, uh, this is a cubic system. But if you consider an FCC system, uh, you can have these atoms which uh, occurs in this plane. They might, might vibrate. But then you would have another uh, plane which would be in the middle of the, uh, these two planes. Um, that would also be present in an FCC system and those would vibrate as well. So the neighboring atoms which are the neighboring planes uh, which contain oscillating atoms they are at a distance a half or half of uh, the, so the brilliant zone should be pi by a half and that's why you have 2 pi by a here. So uh, you can uh, you can think about what would be uh, the brilliant zone uh, what would be the value of k here along 110 direction that's for for you to calculate uh, one more thing I would like to describe here is uh, how many uh, number of k points would be or how many k vectors uh, would there be in the first brilliant zone uh, because it might be a bit uh, slightly complicated than the usual calculations we have been doing before so how many number of k points are there in the first brilliant zone to find this, uh, you have to let's say you take uh, either an aluminum or this cubic crystal, uh, and you take uh, a chunk of it. Um, say that um, it is a cube of length l, l, and l uh, on each side. Uh, then uh, you can take a volume of the whole solid, and you divide it by the volume of the conventional unit cell. So a which you measure from X-ray diffraction is the length of the unit size of the conventional unit cell. So if you do this, uh, uh, and if you assume N is the number of conventional unit cells in the solid, then such a calculation where you divide do this uh, ratio, uh, it would give you N where N would be the number of conventional unit cell. It won't give you the number of primitive unit cell. Uh, so to find the number of primitive unit cell, you divide L cube by the volume of a primitive cubic cell, which which would be one fourth of the volume of the conventional unit cell. So you divide it by a cube by four, and once you do this, you get four n, where n would be the number of conventional unit cell, and four times of that. 
So these would this would be the number of primitive unit cells, and this would also be the number of k points in the first brilliant zone. So the number of k points in the first brilliant zone uh, is equal to the number of primitive unit cell and not conventional unit cell. That's something which you need to remember. Yet another example, um, and that example is that of a uh, diamond uh, diamond crystal, uh, which can be that of a diamond, uh, which is copper, uh, uh, carbon, or silicon and germanium can also uh, also do have the same structure. So it has an FCC uh, crystal, a lattice, which is a face-centered cubic lattice, but this time the basis consists of two atoms rather than one atom. So Let's say if you have a lattice point here, so you put a carbon atom at exactly that lattice point and then you put an extra carbon atom at a quarter, a quarter and a quarter distance away from this lattice point. And you do this for all the lattice points uh, in this uh, FCC lattice. So if you take a primitive unit cell in this case, a primitive unit cell would contain uh, two atoms. So the number of atoms per primitive unit cell or the number of atom per lattice point in this case is equals to three. So by previous calculations, uh, we should have uh, six total uh, vibrational branches in the dispersion. Three of them should be acoustic branches and three should be optical branches. So uh, let's look at the real example of germanium, which has exactly this structure. And in germanium, uh, you do have uh, you don't have six branches, but you have four branches. So indeed you do have optical branch present, which wasn't there in the previous case because there was just one atom per primitive unit cell in the case of aluminum and copper. But in the case of germanium, because you have two, so you do have optical branch and you do have acoustic branch. So this, uh, these are the directions along one. So along one, 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 if you look, then in this case, you do have uh, the acoustic branches, you, you have two acoustic branches rather than uh, one acoustic, uh, two, uh, you have one uh, transverse branch rather than two transverse branches. And uh, similarly, you have one transverse optical branch here instead of two optical branches, which would mean that uh, um, for, let's say, uh, along one, one, one direction, which is this. So the if the propagation uh, of the latest vibration is along one 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 direction, which is perpendicular to this latest vibration. So the uh, transverse vibration in this direction uh, is exactly the same as transverse vibration in this direction, or the spring constant in this direction exactly equal to the spring constant in this direction for propagation along one one one. That's why the two transverse branches are uh, degenerate, uh, and similar is the case for one 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 zero zero as well. So this is. Uh, what we expect as we expect for uh, 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 a, a diamond-like crystal which has uh, two uh, atoms per unit primitive cell. So just a detail um, about uh, the, how these branches are. Uh, normally you can have solids which are covalent. So most of the solids can be uh, classified as uh, either covalent or ionic or a mixture of these two. So as a general rule, uh, if you take a covalent solid, uh, so in a covalent solid, we can uh, the the atom, the electrons, uh, the electronic cloud which form the bonding, they are localized between neighboring atoms. Uh, in the case of ionic solid, the, the electronic cloud is um, uh, transferred more to one atom than, than the other. So you have, might have more electronic uh, wave function on one atom than another. So this, uh, these are the two different types of uh, solids which you can have. And the latest vibration for these two solids are different. Uh, so the main difference occurs at the, in the optical branch where the uh, longitudinal optical and the longitudinal uh, transverse optical branches they, they are degenerate around k equals to zero, but in the case of an ionic solid, these two are non-degenerate, and um, th there, there is a certain splitting between them, uh, which in other words would mean that if you have, let's say, a propagation in one direction, let's say in this direction, 
the oscillation uh, optical branch oscillation in this direction has a different spring constant for lower uh, k value as compared to this one in the case of an ionic solid but in the case of a covalent solid if uh, um, solid is, is the lattice vibration is moving in one direction the oscillation in this direction and the one which is perpendicular uh, both have similar frequencies at lower k values or longer wavelengths so this is one way of uh, just by looking at the vibrational dispersion or the latest vibration dispersion you can identify for example if you look at the diamond uh, you can immediately identify that though uh, these branches uh, the longitudinal optical and transverse optical are degenerate here so uh, it it would have a covalent uh, bonding in here and indeed that's the case that germanium does have covalent bonding in its crystal structure last detail which i would like to describe about um, these uh, dispersions uh, of latest vibration is the number of modes in the first brillion zone so for a diatomic chain you can see the length of your unit cell which can um, and the unit cell consists of two atoms um, if l is the length of the solid then n uh, capital n would be length uh, divided by l, length of the unit cell um, and this would give you the number of unit cells in the solid but it would not be equal to the number of atoms the number of atoms are twice this n uh, you apply then periodic boundary conditions uh, given this length and the periodic boundary conditions uh, give you discrete values in k and the, um, and these discrete value are simply given by 2 pi by l um, multiplied by some integer n so uh, the distance uh, between neighboring k point is simply 2 pi by l in k space uh, so if you consider only longitudinal vibration of these atoms uh, in which case atom is only allowed to move along the direction of propagation um, then you have the number of k points uh, within the first brillion zone is equals to n uh, um, n is also equal to the number of unit cells in the solid uh, and for each uh, k value uh, you do have two modes of oscillation one for the acoustic branch and one for the optical branch so the number of vibration per uh, k value are basically two then the total number of vibrational frequencies in the first brillion zone would be equal to the number of total k points which exist here multiply by two because each point k point has two so you should in, in total get two n uh, different modes in the first billion zone for longitudinal oscillation of a diatomic chain in one dimension you can also look at this problem in a different way and that is by considering the degree of motion of each atom so let's say uh, each of this atom is allowed to move along one direction which is the direction of propagation of waves so the degree of freedom of motion of each atom is one uh, but the total number of atoms in the 1d crystal is not capital n uh, where n capital n is the number of unit cell but rather is two times n so two times n is the total number of atoms in the one dimension crystal and each atom has only one degree of freedom of motion um, so the total degrees of uh, freedom of motion in the solid is two times n and so this is another way of finding the total number of allowed uh, vibrational modes of a certain solid is to find the total number of atoms in the solid then multiply it by the uh, degrees of freedom of motion of each atom and this would give you the total number of modes in the solid so in this case just for if you consider only the longitudinal vibration you get uh, two n's or twice the um, uh, number of unit cells in you here. allow for um, three-dimensional um, degree of motion or in other words uh, you, uh, if you have not only longitudinal oscillation but also the two transverse vibration allowed uh, let's look at the case here then capital n which uh, would be the total number of uh, k values in the first billion zone and um, because in this case uh, you would have each um, uh, each uh, k value uh, would have six different frequencies 
two frequencies because because uh, uh, you have two different atoms so and that's why you would have two branches optical and acoustic branch and then because uh, each uh, branch would have three different polarization uh, one longitudinal uh, one uh, longitudinal and two transverse so two times three it would give you six uh, different um, sub branches or six different values of uh, frequencies at a particular k value so the total number of vibrational mode in the first brilliant zone should be equals to two times three times n uh, which would be six times n so indeed that's the case so you take a certain value of k in the dispersion and you get uh, one two three four five six six different um, frequencies and and total and you you multiply the total number of k values in the first billion zone by these six and you would get all the uh, modes within the system um, another way of looking at the same problem is looking at the degree of freedom of motion so each atom you know can move in three di directions in this direction uh, and in the transverse direction and into the page and out, out, of, out of the page so a total number of atoms in the crystal is two times n where n was the number of unit cells and because each unit cell contains two atoms it's two times n is the total number of atoms in the crystal and each atom has a degree of motion uh, freedom of degree of motion equals to three because they can move in three different directions uh, uh, three different along three different axes so the total degree of motion uh, in this solid would be um, three times two n and that would be six times n exactly equals to the number of modes we have in the first brilliant zone. So that's another way of looking at the number of uh, uh, another way of mode counting um, for a certain module. We looked at um, the dispersion of lattice vibration for uh, one dimensional lattice, uh, which contained of uh, two types of uh, bonding. Or two types of atoms uh, or so-called diatomic lattice um, we introduce the concept of acoustic and optical branches in the dispersion of lattice vibration and we looked at how the displacement uh, the relative displacement of uh, the different masses um, relate with respect to each other um, for these normal modes uh, then we introduce a general scheme for calculating the number of branches in lattice uh, vibrational dispersion and we looked at a few uh, examples of real solids uh, to validate our point. So uh, this uh, kind of summarizes uh, the, the content covered in this lecture.